The first case to come before us this morning is Crandall versus Crandall. Both sides will have 15 minutes to argue. If you're the appellant, you can re reserve up to five minutes for the rebuttal. I note that there is a cross appeal in this case. So if you're the appellee cross appellant, you will utilize your 15 minutes um, in one swoop. Uh, please uh, move, mute your microphones when uh, you are not speaking so we can avoid background noise. Please also don't use the names of any minors or victims as we are streaming this live and it will also be posted on YouTube uh, thereafter. We have read the briefs and we were we are ready to proceed when you are. Uh, thank you, Your Honor, I'm ready to proceed. Would you like to reserve any time? I'll reserve uh, two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, Your Honors, may it please the court. Uh, my name is Adam Morris. I'm, in the, I'm here on behalf of the appellant, um, Ms. Crandall, and she's also the cross uh, appellee. Uh, Your Honor, Your Honors, this case is a, uh, this is really about basic fairness in our judicial processes. Um, this case involves a divorce um, that was pending for about uh, nine months. And um, the, the main issue that happened in this case is that the court denied a motion for continuance um, from wife, which would allow her counsel to be appropriately and properly prepared for the trial. And that led to uh, a number of dominoes falling, which caused for there to be mistakes at the trial, and then for there to be many, many errors in the judgment entry. Your Honor, I'm going to point uh, the court to uh, the first assignment of error. This revolves around the denial of the continuance. Um, Your Honors, this case was scheduled for trial in June 2017, and Ms. Crandell, the wife, uh, realized in early June of 2017 that her counsel, L. Ray Jones, was not prepared for trial, was not responding to communication, was not subpoenaing witnesses, and was not um, doing the necessary uh, discovery to get ready for trial. So in early June 2017, she terminates uh, Mr. Jones and immediately hires new counsel in Thomas Collin. Thomas Collin files a motion for continuance with the court. The, uh, in the motion for continuance, he lays out all the reasons why a continuance is necessary. Uh, he goes through all the factors contained in Unger and Shishwa. And um, the court indicates that they would hear the continuance on the first day of trial. The first day of trial comes, and you can see in the transcript, which I put in my brief, there's a long discussion about this uh, continuance. And Mr. Kahlo lays out his reasons why he's requesting the continuance. The court um, denies the continuance orally on the first uh, day of trial. And uh, on the record, the court says, well, you know, when it comes to the subpoenas, this is a three-day trial, and Mr. Kahlo, you can go get your subpoena served in the next few days, and you can get uh, your witnesses here, which um, my client, uh, the appellant uh, wife, would say is uh, completely unreasonable. And the second thing the court says on the record is, well, I gave you uh, a few hours in the morning to talk to opposing, uh, to uh, previous counsel to get prepared. And once again, uh, wife would uh, would assert that that is not a reasonable uh, proposition for an attorney to get prepared for this divorce trial, um, basically in the morning of trial. Your Honor, Your Honors, the the factors con contained in Unger and Shishwal support they're right on point for uh, granting a, a continuance in this case. Wife was only requesting a brief continuance of 30 to 60 days. Uh, she had requested no previous continu to continuances of the trial date. Um, husband's own counsel, uh, who was Mr. McCarter at the time, did not object to the continuance. And when this was brought up at trial, you can see in the transcript, Attorney McCarter uh, indicates, well, I'll just defer to the court. 
All the witnesses were local. All the parties were local. There's no one that was going to be prejudiced by uh, by a continuance. Um, this case was only nine months old. It was not a you know a case that was uh, going on and on. Uh, it was not a um, overage case. Uh, and wife terminated her counsel so she could get prepared for this trial. And she did not do this to, to delay the proceedings. She did not do this to, to try to cause uh, a mess of the proceedings. She did this because she felt like she was not being appropriately rec represented. And everybody should be entitled to be appropriately represented at their divorce trial. Finally, um, wife was prejudiced by the denial, denial of the continuance. Um, as I've laid out in my brief, there's case law about you know, having counsel that's not prepared is a um, is extremely prejudicial to uh, clients, especially in divorce cases. There were valuations that were not completed. Uh, there was a business valuation that was not completed. There were real estate. Um, there was, uh, I'm sorry, there was personal property that was not valued. They had a whole barn of stuff that was not valued. They had vehicles that were not valued. Um, this case involved a prenuptial agreement. It involved a business. Um, it involved premarital property with tracing. Uh, it, it involved some significantly uh, difficult issues. And she was extremely prejudiced by not allowing, not, not being permitted to have counsel that was prepared. And all counsel at the time of the trial was requesting was a brief continuance to get prepared. So your honors, I understand it's an extraordinary remedy to ask for a new trial but uh, appellant is requesting a new trial in this case and that the uh, decree uh, be vacated. Uh, appellant believes that the uh, case law uh, supports that a continuance should have been granted uh, in this case. Uh, Your, Honor, I'm, Your Honors, I'm gonna move on to the assignment of error number nine, which is uh, the denial of spousal support. Um, once again, there were several issues um, in the decision regarding spousal support. This is a case where spousal support should have been granted. The court made several key errors in their analysis of the 14 spouse support factors. First, the, call, the court discusses the income of the parties. In its decision, the court says that both of these parties have substantial assets that have um, substantial income earning assets. That is simply not true. And based upon the evidence that was presented, wife had some investment accounts that were earning about $2,000 per year. Husband had a business interest that was giving him passive income, passive distributions of over $45,000 a year. So by saying that wife had significant ass income earning assets was simply not true. Also looking at the earning abilities of the parties. Uh, husband had been in a motorcycle accident, but he was cleared to work three months after the divorce trial. And it was known at the divorce trial, there's testimony on this, that he was going to be cleared to work. And um, the, the judge knew this, that in October of 2017, he could go back to work, which he did. And uh, so he had significant earning abilities. Wife was uh, basically had not worked for several years and had some mental health issues that were laid out in the judge's decision. And then when it comes to the factors regarding retirement accounts and other assets, as you can see in my brief, that the court was not clear about how retirement accounts were to be divided. The court was not clear about how, uh, how uh, other personal property, other, other assets were to be divided. The court was not clear about how much each party was gonna get out of each, each piece of real estate. So there's no way that the court could have analyzed those factors based upon um, the court's decision. And the court just made a very basic mistake. I mean, the court indi indicates that the duration of the marriage is 106 months, when clearly the duration of the marriage is 156 months. So the, the, the court basically uh, had uh, taken four years off the marriage based upon uh, its own decision. Uh, and the court says that both parties have significant assets to maintain their standard of living. That was simply not true. Um, wife uh, uh, did not have 
the assets to main her, maintain her standard living that husband did. Um, Your Honor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to, uh, so therefore, if this court does not grant a new trial, this court should vacate the decree and remand it regarding um, the spousal support issues. Uh, Your Honors, I'm going to move on to uh, the assignment of error number two and three regarding the UBS individual retirement account. And this is just a clear example of the errors in this decision. Uh, the court believed that there were two accounts. There was a UBS investment account and a UBS IRA account. Uh, husband only has one account. He has a UBS individual retirement account. And on page 12 of the decree, the court gives the entire account to husband. And then on the same page, the court says that the IRA account should be divided equally. So the, the decision is very unclear and it doesn't even indi indicate that the judge understood that there were that there was only one account. So the facts, the facts are that husband had a premarital American funds and Templeton growth fund account. Those got rolled into a UBS IRA account. The, um, the UBS IRA account, husband admitted during the trial that he made marital contributions uh, into that account. Uh, husband admitted um, uh, during the trial that uh, he really couldn't provide any kind of uh, tracing uh, for that account. Um, husband, uh, husband provided some documents, but they were not complete documents of the account from the date of marriage uh, forward, and there was no tracing analysis uh, done. There's no other way to treat this account but to treat it as marital property and divide it. And that's what my client is uh, requesting uh, that the court uh, do is uh, divide the um, divide that account. And my client believes that that's a, a fair and reasonable way of resolving uh, that issue. So, counsel, so I can make counsel, I, so I can make sure I'm straight on this. Um, you are advocating that the UBS um, IRA actually be divided equally. Uh, yes, Your Honor. If there if there's not a new trial in this case, and there's not new evidence presented, the only evidence that's in the record currently is that there were marital contributions into this account with with no tracing um, or no. Wasn't there any? Was there any? Wasn't there testimony though or evidence that he obviously had had the account prior to the marriage? Yes, there was testimony, and uh, there was evidence, and and if. The court finds that that is uh, reasonable and appropriate based upon his testimony. Uh, I don't. I don't believe that there was documentation on it, but there was testimony that he did have um, some balances uh, prior to the marriage, and there was an agreement. So I do agree with the court that that could be that portion could be siphoned out. Whatever that number is that was in the prenuptial agreement could be siphoned out and the rest could be divided equally. So I, Your Honor, I do agree with you on that on that point. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, Counsel, I believe- you're just now reaching, you're yeah. just now reaching that two minutes. Okay, I'm going to uh, pause here and I will um, do my rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning again, everybody. Attorney David McCarter on behalf of uh, Christopher Crandall, Appley, and Cross Appellant. Good morning to everybody. Uh, judges, I'm gonna begin my argument very briefly, just talking about our two assignments of error, then I'm gonna respond briefly to uh, uh, what my opposing counsel has raised today. Um, first assignment of error and, and, and very limited is that the court failed to award um, the separate property that was outlined in the exhibit on the prenuptial agreement. There was a lot of discussion and a lot of testimony about the prenuptial agreement and the exhibits contained therein. The prenuptial agreement and the judges can review basically just outlined what the parties had as far as their separate property coming into the marriage. The exhibit B on the prenuptial agreement, which ironically is exhibit A, outlined two two distinct things that, that um, husband brought into the marriage 
that were not awarded to him by the trial court. Uh, number one was just a list of personal property. Um, the, the court just never addressed that husband should retain the personal property as outlined in that exhibit. Very, very limited. That's the sole issue there. The, yes, the other was a Western Reserve account that he had prior to marriage with his mother that then became Westfield Bank in an acquisition. Um, and that was not awarded to, to uh, husband um, yet identified in that um, exhibit on the um, prenuptial agreement. Uh, really, that is, that is the limited scope of, of that assignment of error. The other, my counsel and I both kind of agree, and then we don't agree, and that is focusing on the retirement account, and that's at, now at UBS. I do agree uh, with counsel that there does seem to be conflicting language by the judge. I believe that it, quite frankly, after reviewing and preparing for today's oral argument, I've come to the conclusion that I believe it was, quite frankly, uh, the judge was using a template on the division of assets and left the last sentence, quite frankly, on the top of her decision and left the balance of a paragraph that probably just should not have been, uh, you know, should not have remained. The UBS account did contain premarital um, components. Um, I disagree with my counsel and his argument that there was only testimony, quite to the contrary, there were exhibits as to the Templeton um, funds that were premarital, also in the prenuptial agreement. That was an exhibit as acknowledged and signed by wife. And it was uncontroverted that those Templeton assets went into the UBS account. Same with American funds. There were exhibits showing that the American funds were had prior to marriage, also contained in the prenuptial agreement, also contained in the prenuptial exhibits and uncontroverted that those funds came prior to marriage. And those funds were also contained inside the UBS account. In addition, there were um, $2,000 gifts, uncontroverted, given to by my client's family to him. And the testimony indicated that those gifts all went into, again, the UBS account. Um, so I believe that the court did not necessarily lose its way when making that analysis that it was a separate property asset and awarding that to husband. Um, but then unfortunately in the top of page 13 of the judgment entry of divorce, I believe the balance of that, of that the, literally the last two sentences was again, unfortunately probably more of a cut and paste uh, type of situation by the judge. Um, and if those last two sentences were removed, uh, that would cure those issues. Counsel? Please. Counsel. Yes, um, just like your um, opponent has indicated that he agrees that there is there was evidence of some premarital um, assets in the account as well as premarital assets were added to the account. Uh, do you acknowledge that there was uh, actual marital assets, that, that there was funds that were added to that during the marriage that might be marital assets? I do not disagree with counsel that that was the testimony by my client. It was our position, Judge, being as frank as always with the court. It was our position in our trial brief uh, going into this matter that a passive growth analysis that was going to be needed and to be ordered and equally divided by the parties in order to determine what the marital contributions were and the, gro the growth and or losses um, with regards to those contributions. I appreciate that. So it seems to me like both sides here are really saying there's some major issues with this decree. I wouldn't disagree with that, Judge Carr. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, mean, I think candidly, just looking at the, uh, just looking at the practice, the fact that both parties appealed, mm -hmm. both parties asked for a remand so that both parties could file, you know, uh, particular motions for relief. Um, I think that speaks volumes. Thank you. Um, I disagree with uh, my uh, learned uh, uh, counsel's analysis with regards to the spousal support issue, candidly. Um, at the time of trial, neither party was working. Um, there, neither party was producing income. My client had gone into debt almost $60,000 having to live off of his parents. Um, 
a debt that was assigned and to my client um, and, and not ordered to be repaid by wife. Um, the, the, his injuries were horrific. The testimony was uncontradicted that although he was cleared to return to work, the testimony was uncontradicted that he was not going to be able to return to work doing what he did prior to for the family business in that his, his job was primarily to retrieve cores from batteries that weighed anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds. This is a man with a fractured pelvis, bulging disc, multiple surgeries. I think the last count that he had four surgeries during the pendency of the divorce and was slated for more. Um, you juxtapose that with a, the with a wife who, although wasn't working, uh, had no real uh, excuse as to why she was not working and why not stepping up and putting her own oar in the water. This is a 13 year marriage. I don't disagree with counsel that there was a math there uh, that that happens. I like to say that if you if you look at a lawyer who's good at math, we call them doctor. So the judge did the uh, did the math wrong on there, but she definitely made the findings of fact candidly in the introduction as far as the date the day of the, of the divorce was correct on page one of the decree. Um, and this matter came for trial on uh, June 13th and 14th of 2017. So yes, there was a math there, but I don't think that, that affected materially. I don't believe that, you know, quite frankly, and just in, in closing, I don't believe there should be a new trial in this matter. I believe, I don't disagree with, with, with the conversation Judge Carr and I just had, that there are some substantial problems, specifically with the retirement account that, that um, may have to be addressed. I think that quite frankly, it could be addressed with the same position that I stated in my trial brief, that if the court just ordered a passive growth analysis, uh, segregating the $2,000 um, gift from the IRA, the Templeton Fund and the American Funds, and then ordered a passive growth analysis and an equal division, that would remedy that situation. I don't even think there's testimony needed. Uh, barring that, quite frankly, and the award of those couple pieces of property, I think this matter can be fixed. It does not need to be retried. Um, this is a 13-year marriage, and you know, and if we're going to retry this case, we're in jeopardy of putting these people in litigation almost as long as they were married. Thank you all for your attention. Everyone have a good day. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Morris, you have two minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I've got a, a brief rebuttal. Uh, your Honor, I agree with Attorney McCarter uh, that there are substantial errors um, in this decision. And based upon the fact that wife's counsel was not prepared for trial, based upon the errors in the decision, the, the findings of fact that are clearly against the manifest weight of the evidence, uh, there's precedent in this, in this court, in the, Lee, uh, in the Lee case that I cite uh, in my brief, uh, permitting this court to take the extraordinary, and I understand that it's extraordinary remedy of ordering a new trial. And these are exactly the facts to um, support uh, the position for a, a new trial. This is exactly um, why a party should be given um, access to prepared uh, counsel and that the trial court and I understand the court, the trial court has control over its docket and, and, and should, should have control over its docket, but there needs to be some flexibility for instances just like this, when clearly there's a breakdown in the attorney-client relationship um, and there needs to be a change of counsel. Um, I, I can understand if this was the, the second or the third continuance of a trial, but this trial had never been continued. And for some reason, um, the trial court felt like it needed to go forward with this hearing, even knowing that wife's counsel uh, was not prepared. So your honors, I believe you have all the information to assist you in uh, making a decision. And I thank you for your time uh, and your attention to this case. Counsel, before we end, uh, I just wanted to ask you both, did, uh, did you try mediation in our court of appeals? Uh, yes, we did try mediation. Okay. We, we did. And we, you, don't, you don't have to tell me anything more. I just wanted to make sure because you both seem like reasonable uh, attorneys and I thought maybe we could resolve this.
Well, fifty percent of that analysis was was very astute. <laughs> Sorry, Thank Mr. you Morris. both for your arguments today. <laughs> the court will take the matter under advisement. We will issue a decision, which will be mailed to both parties as well as posted on the Ohio Supreme Court website. Thank you again, gentlemen, for being here today.